All right, good evening. Good evening. Welcome, everybody. We are uh, calling to order our first meeting of 2022. Today is uh, January 11th. It is 6.33 p.m. And again, thank you so much, everybody that is joining us live as well by Zoom. It is beautiful to see so many people in the place. Um, and I hope that your new year has started off um, on a good foot. For our meeting, we will have a moment of silence. and. If we want to just take a moment to think about all the families um, and individuals that have suffered with this latest COVID wave that has hit us like a thunderstorm. Um, and so there are some people who are still getting very, very sick from it. So maybe if we take a moment to think of those people today. Thank you so much. And for those who are able, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. So today is um, a very exciting day. Um, and a, a new start, not just a new year, but a new start um, and a new team, a new governing team that I'm so excited um, to get the opportunity to work with. Um, so Maggie, um, we will start with the swearing in of our new um, board members and current board members. Okay. Great. Well, welcome everyone. I'm going to have uh, our uh, legal representative, uh, Bob Wilson, come up and get us started on that process. Thank you, Bob. Good evening, Madam Chair. Members of the board and Madam Superintendent. This evening we have the privilege of swearing in two new members and re swearing another member to new terms on the board. The swearing in will be done by a University of Georgia graduate, and today I know she's wearing that very proudly. <laughs> uh, she went to the uh, University of Georgia undergraduate school and went to Georgia State Law School. Judge Rothelia Stroud is a judge of the magistrate court here in DeKalb County and oversees the uh, mental health court for that division of our courts. But she's more particularly, in my opinion, the chief judge for the municipal court of the city of Decatur and does an outstanding job for us. So I'm gonna ask Judge Stroud to come forward to administer the oaths. We are gonna do them separately, each one. And uh, the first, th these oaths are a little tricky because there's actually two oaths. So they'll both be administered. They will all have to be signed by the judge, but the party receiving the oath, uh, the office holder, will sign and date twice. Today is the 11th of January of 22. Please try to write 22. <laughs> uh, we will start with Dr. Carmen Sultan. Would you please come forward? Please come up here. Your husband certainly come come with her. Any other family members that you want? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Please come up. I let old people in here. <laughs> let me in here. <laughs> Okay. I am not your name. I, Carmen Sulpis, do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I will execute the duties that I will have of the office of school board member. Of the office of school board member. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. That I am not the holder. That I'm not the holder of any unaccounted for of any unaccounted for public money due public money due the state the state. That I am not the holder that I am not the holder of any office of trust any office of trust under the government under the government of the United States of the other states any other states 
or any foreign state which I am by or which I am by the laws of the state of Georgia the laws of the state of Georgia prohibited from holding prohibited from holding that I am otherwise qualified that I'm otherwise qualified to hold this office to hold this office according to the Constitution according to the Constitution and laws of Georgia and laws of Georgia that I will support that I will support the Constitution of the United States the Constitution of the United States and laws of Georgia and laws of Georgia that I am uh, excuse me that I will support that I will support the Constitution of the United States the Constitution of the United States and of Georgia and of Georgia and that I have met and that I have met all resident requirements, all resident requirements as defined by the Constitution, as defined by the Constitution and laws of Georgia and laws of Georgia. And that second one that I, Mr. Wilson mentioned, I pronounce your name again. I, Herman Olson, the citizen of DeKalb County, a citizen of DeKalb County and the city of Decatur and the city of Decatur and being an elected official and being an elected official of the Board of Education of the Board of Education of the city of Decatur. And the recipient of public funds and the recipient of public funds for services rendered for services rendered as such official as such official do solemnly swear do solemnly swear and affirm and affirm that I will support, support the Constitution of the United States the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution and the Constitution of Georgia you are duly Fuel sign here, and I'll be the official witness. And I'll get it noted on there. My name is 42. Uh, no, I got you it. Are, okay, the official good. Witness. Let's leave okay. it. Okay. I'm going to ask the doctor to just have a seat back where she was, and we're going to seat everybody once we have them all motorized and properly seated. Mr. Utch, if you would come forward with any family members are, that you might like to have. Follow likewise. I have pronounced your name. I, Hans Hook, solemnly swear that I will execute the duties that I will execute the duties of the office of school board member of the office of school board member to the best of my ability to the best of my ability that I am not the holder that I am not the holder of any unaccounted for of any unaccounted for public money public money due to state. Do the state. Not the holder. Of any office of trust. Of any office of trust. Under the government. Government. Of the United States. Of the United States. Any other state. Any other state. Or any foreign state. Or any foreign state. Which I am by. Which I am by. The laws of the state of Georgia. The laws of the state of Georgia. Prohibited from holding. Prohibited from holding. That I am otherwise qualified. I am otherwise qualified. To hold this office. To hold this office. According to the Constitution, according to the Constitution and the laws of Georgia, and the laws of Georgia, that I will support, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States and of Georgia, and of Georgia, and that I've met, and that I have met all resident requirements, all resident requirements as defined by the Constitution, as defined by the Constitution and laws of Georgia, and laws of Georgia. I pronounce your name again. I Hans Hood. A citizen of DeKalb County. A citizen of DeKalb County. And the city of Decatur. And the city of Decatur. And being a, an elected official. And being an elected official. Of the Board of Education. Of the Board of Education. Of the city of Decatur. Of the city of Decatur. And the recipient of public funds. And the recipient of public funds. For services rendered. For services rendered. As such official. As such official. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. And affirm. And affirm. That I will support. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of Georgia. And the Constitution of Georgia. Thank you, you have Thank you, Judge. Is that what it was? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
just like left right here. Which one is it? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's see. We hear from one other person. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Dana John. Okay. Take a quick pick of the three before you go back up. Okay. Everybody with you, Alan. Yeah. Uh, uh, right hand, thank you. And I pronounce your name. I, Jana Johnson Davis. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will execute the duty. That I will execute the duty. Of the office of school board member. Of the office of school board member. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. That I am not the holder. That I am not the holder. Of any unaccounted for. Of any unaccounted for. Public money. Public money. Do this day. Do this. I am not the holder. That I am not the holder. Of any office of trust. Of any office of trust. Under the government. Under the government. Of the any other state, any other state, or any foreign state, or any foreign state, which I am by the law, which I am by the law of the state of Georgia, of Georgia prohibited from holding, prohibited from holding, that I am otherwise qualified, that I am otherwise qualified to hold this office, to hold this office according to the Constitution, according to the Constitution and laws of Georgia, and laws of Georgia. That I will support. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States and of Georgia. And of Georgia. And that I have met. And that I have met all resident requirements. All resident requirements as defined by the Constitution. As defined by the Constitution. And laws of Georgia. And laws of Georgia. I pronounce your name again. I, Dana Johnson Davis, a citizen of DeKalb County. A citizen of DeKalb County and the city of Decatur. And the city of Decatur. And being an elected official, and being an elected official of the Board of Education, of the Board of Education of the City of Decatur, of the City of Decatur, and the recipient of public funds, and the recipient of public funds for services rendered, for services rendered as such official, as such official, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear, and affirm, and affirm that I will support, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of Georgia, and the Constitution of Georgia. You are duly sworn. I think they want to get a picture of all three of you together. We do a picture of us all. Yeah, I think it would help. I got you. Yeah, if uh, if we could get a picture of all three of you together.
Madam Chair, Board Member Sultan, Board Member Utz, and Returning Board Member Johnson Davis have been duly elected and certified. They have been duly sworn and witnessed. They are now authorized to conduct business on behalf of the City Schools of Decatur. That was awesome and definitely one of my favorite times of the year. Uh, welcome everyone up here uh, for the first time. How's it feel? <laughs> awesome, awesome. All right, so our next order of business will be the election of board officers. Dr. Herman? Yes. Um, okay, so can I, we will do both uh, chair and vice chair. So um, is there a nomination for someone for the position of chair? I nominate Jana Johnson Davis. Okay. Any other nomination? All right. Is there a nomination for vice chair? A nomination. James Herndon. Any other nominations for vice chair? All right. Board members, you have a ballot in front of you. Please go ahead and circle your choice for chair and vice chair, and then you can pass those my way. This is an easy one. So I am proud to share our new chair of the board it will be Gina Johnson Davis and vice chair will be James Herndon. So congratulations on your award. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank uh, my fellow board members as well as the city of Decatur for being um, so supportive of me as the president this last year. Uh, president. <laughs> Uh, chair, <laughs> Adam Chair, sorry. Um, and I just I look forward to our, our board members taking on the reins for this year and um, just continuing into what I think is going to be an amazing year together. So as my last order of business as the chair, I will call for a motion to take a five-minute recess so we can move our chairs and computers around and we'll be right back. Can I have a motion, please? A motion that we take, take a five-minute five break. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Contract um, that needs to be changed to superintendent search. May I have a motion to approve? So move. Second. Second. Thank you. Um, I also want to inform everyone that at the end of this meeting, we will move into an executive session to discuss personnel matters. It, um, thank you. And no action will be taken during the executive session. Okay. Are there any revisions to the minutes? No. May I have a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve the minutes. Second. So moved. All right. So now we'll move to the spotlight with Oker. All right, I would like to welcome Ms. Frazier up to the podium to kick us off on our spotlight of Oker. I mean, I think she has also brought one of her teachers to speak with her. So, welcome. Good afternoon, Dr. Furman and the board. Welcome to board members. I'm Tanisha Frazier. I'm the proud principal of Oakhurst. I'm so excited to be here to share with you our equity spotlight for tonight. As we were planning, like other schools, thinking about returning to school um, after students have been out for a while, many of them have been out for a year and a half, with virtual learning, we started to naturally think about the gap that might exist in their knowledge as they return to the building. So we really wanted to think about um, an innovative way to fill those gaps, but still move forward in their learning for the school year. So we knew there are standards teachers were required to teach for this school year, but also we knew there will be some things that were missing and we needed to address those those things. So I went to the Oakhurst staff with this idea of creating a new special for math and reading um, remediation and enrichment. And Ms. Staten, Shannon Staten, 
showed interest in it. And Shannon is one of our um, just amazing teacher at Oakhurst who has taught K through two. And so she has a unique skill set that we really wanted to tap into. She also has a reputation of being very innovative and creative and reaching all students. So we, we um, thought about this and thought this would be a great opportunity to really try to provide the different needs for the different needs of our students. We knew there would be at different levels and this was just an innovative way for us to meet their needs. So I'll turn it over to Shannon and let her tell you a little bit about what she does in this special we've created called Game Day and how it's really being used as a catalyst for equity at Oakhurst. And I'll just be really brief. It's such a great opportunity for myself as a teacher and for students to have a place to come to work on standards and to feel that freedom to learn without judgment. And um, you can see it and feel it in our classroom. And um, it's a great honor to be the teacher leading that experience. And it's incredible to watch the kids be able to engage with these standards, but in a way that is outside of that classroom setting. So being able to circle back to things that maybe they haven't mastered previously or getting to try new things that they haven't yet experienced in class. And um, we've got a video to kind of introduce it to you guys, and I hope you enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes, it's great. <laughs> 
kids are engaged, they're active, they're thinking, I don't know how she does all of the technology while she's moved. It was just like a work of art. So thank you for all you do. It's amazing. And Tanisha, thank you for having the innovative idea to think outside the box to keep our kids engaged and actively learning. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I imagine how liberating it must be for students to feel like they're free to learn. That was really impactful to see that statement from that student. So thank you. I'll say too, when I asked them about game day, having kids Tell me that. Absolutely. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that with us tonight. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Yeah, and I, I want to thank you, Ms. Peyton, for being willing to speak up for what you want to see in the classroom. Mm -hmm. and it's been a tough 22 months, and um, you've never been afraid to <laughs> speak up mm -hmm. and demand better of us, always for our kids. Mm -hmm. And that's never been in doubt. So. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you to Oakhurst. Awesome work. Thank you. I think the presentation anticipated my question, which was going to be how do we replicate this across? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah. I am happy to share absolutely anything I create with anyone who wants it, whether it's just for specials. So if you know anyone who would like to utilize any of the games I create for K through two, or move it for other grades as well. I'm happy to share everything I have. That's great. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you so thank much, you. Thank you. All right, so we will now open the floor for public comment. We request that anyone who wishes to speak on the topics related to the agenda or other policy issues sign up at least 30 minutes prior to the meeting. The sign-up form is available through the board website. The time limit for all speakers is three minutes. Persons speaking during public comment will not be permitted to yield the floor or transfer unused time to other speakers. The most useful statements or comments to the board are those that are related to matters of policy over which the board has jurisdiction. All comments shall be addressed to the board as a body and not to individual members. Speakers should make comments in a manner that maintains decorum and is not disruptive to the meeting. Citizens who seek to address the board with an issue or concern about a specific employee or student should address such matters through the appropriate district or school administrative levels. Issues or concerns regarding specific personnel or students are not appropriate to be discussed here before the board. Ms. Bruden, how many people do we have time for public comment? And how many in person? One. Okay, we'll we start right in front with the um, Okay, the first person up is Ms. Tracy Anderson, which is on Zoom. I'm unable to find Ms. Anderson, so we're going to move on to the man, the one and only, <laughs> Mr. Cooley. Uh oh, oh there he is. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Hey, good evening, everybody. Great to see everybody. Congratulations to Hans, to Carmen, to Jana, and great to see James and Sasha and everybody, all the great people of uh, City Schools of Decatur. My name is Kunle Ogunaye. I am an SLC member of Decatur High School. I'm a parent of a 10th grader, 7th grader at Renfro, 
and preschooler at uh, College Heights. I want to first of all commend the work of the board uh, of the district as it pertains to career. The work of the Dictator Career Academy is phenomenal. Mr. Sproul is doing a fantastic job. I'm really excited that the board is putting a lot of energy, emphasis, resources behind career. I have spoken several times that I really believe in the 21st century, that it's not going to be only four-year traditional college that will lead to um, exciting career opportunities. And I'm glad that we're opening those career opportunities to our young people. Two things that I'd like to, two seeds I'd like to plant in your mind. I attended a career um, academy, career network, I forget what it was called, Georgia College and Career Academy Network. And one of the other participants mentioned that at their school, they take all sixth and seventh graders to visit the technical college, to see all, to expose them to all the career opportunities. Uh, I went to visit once. I went into, they have a wonderful studio for mixing and recording. Man, this thing, I want to go back to school. <laughs> so just something as the next school year, maybe that's something we could do. Six, seventh graders, bust them there so that they see for themselves, oh, this is really tangible. And I'd also like to plant a seed of, can we consider uh, opening up some of these programs to adults and parents in the community? Has an IT certificate program, just, I don't know, there's so much interesting stuff. I, as a parent, I'd love to be able to do some things in the evenings. And then uh, finally, I would like to thank you very much for keeping schools open as much as possible. I know it's a problem, but for me as a parent, I prefer it. You know, fortunate college heights has to shop for two years. I can live with that. So thank you very much and wish you guys uh, success. Thank you. Next up is Juana Bakra via Zoom. Hi, I'm here. You can speak now. Uh, good evening, Gordon, and everybody else. I can hear an echo. Um, my name is Twani Batra, and I'm a Decatur resident and parent to an eighth grader and a senior at DHS. Um, first, I want to thank the parents who have signed up to be subs and for supervising lunch. It is a big sacrifice. Uh, some of you have had to take time off work. You've done an incredible job. Thank you so much. You have provided s support to this community when it was needed most. I also want to thank all the students that have followed the rules and have made the best of these unusual circumstances that have been very challenging for us all. But most of all, I wanted to thank the CSD teachers and staff who have been on the front line and have gone above and beyond. Um, at this point, I have two questions or points that I wanted to say. It's like, at first, CSD chose not to go virtual in the first week unlike other districts. And one question I had was, under what circumstances would CSD go virtual? 100% virtual. Um, when I look at the mitigation plans, I see four levels, but it's not there. If it was clear, we would be able to plan better uh, and uh, the community will have more information to work with. Um, Mr. Wiseman gave us very adequate heads up last week when uh, Renfro had to go virtual and that worked well. But um, please, if you can spell it out under what circumstances we will go virtual, we can plan for it better. My other request is let's not just wait for the teachers or students to be sick. Let's take community transmission levels into account when we come up with this because I would rather have healthy uh, community than sick uh, students and teachers. Secondly, last week excused absence were allowed, but there was no virtual instruction and this continues so, uh, as well. How is this equitable for the kids who stay home and receive no instructions? How how is it equitable to have parents and staff and short-term staff filling in which are not qualified to teach and almost acting as babysitters equitable? How do we make sure that our kids get what they need? The, sometimes we react to difficult circumstances by overcorrection. And 
long-term virtual has made it seem like so, so, so bad that we are not able to use it as a tool. It is just a tool that is necessary when it is, it should be used. So please don't just make it happen. I love the way this community has gotten together, but there is, we do have the response. We have a responsibility towards the community, towards the kids and towards the teachers and staff as well. Um, ideally, the first week virtual would have acted as a circuit breaker. I know it would have been tough, uh, but the case of peaking, but for any future peak, if they happen, if we have a clear plan and not kind of trying to decide at the last minute, that would be very, very helpful. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Katie Bishop Barton. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, okay, wonderful. Uh, good evening. My name is Katie Bishop Barton, and I've been a resident of Oakhurst Village in Decatur since 2003. I hold a 20 year career in marketing, biotechnology, and I own my own private securities firm. Firstly, I would like to thank the board for dedicating their time to our schools and our children, and I appreciate my right to free speech for three minutes on this platform, which is protected under our constitution. The purpose, the purpose of my speech is to protect the physical, medical, and psychological freedoms of our children and to provide the wisdom of common sense decision making. Let me explain that you don't need to be a mathematician or a medical doctor to understand that mandating a vaccine loaded with toxic heavy metals to combat a virus that has a 99.98% survival rate qualifies as insanity. You don't need to have a PhD to understand that mask wearing creates lifelong psychological damage, social anxiety, and prevents critical nonverbal communication, which is essential for our children's growth, learning, and ability to feel safe. Additionally, mask wearing lowers oxygen intake to dangerous levels, which decreases the power of our natural immune system. You don't need to be a psychologist to understand that any authority requiring healthy children to wear masks under the guise of quote unquote safety is completely and utterly psychotic. You don't need to be an attorney to understand the CV mRNA vaccine mandates violate the Nuremberg Code, they violate the right to informed consent, and it is a discriminatory act to deny education to unvaccinated children because those who are vaccinated can still get infected and transmit the virus. Lastly, I would like to end my speech from a broader perspective with a quick lesson on etymology because it's important for all of us children and adults alike to understand that the original meaning of the word virtual is almost. And so I dare you to replace the word virtual with the word almost as you go about your daily life. Do you want your children to experience an almost education? Do you want your children to learn in an almost classroom? Do you want to experience the thrill of life through an almost reality? It's time to wake up. It's time to take off your mask muzzles and reconnect with your God-given purpose on this planet, which is to protect the right of free will for the future of our children. Thank you very much for the time. This morning, morning grind. Morning. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Hello. Can hear you. you can hear me. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, my name is Marnie Gradzen. I am a parent of a 2019 graduate from Decatur High School, and I currently have a daughter in 10th grade. And first and foremost, I want to congratulate all of the um, new board members and also would like to give a big shout out to the nurses within the city schools of Decatur system. I know they have been working their butts off and um, I really appreciate that. I just wanted to take a moment tonight to point out something that I've noticed through the, our experience um, with when we had to shut down. But I actually noticed this back when my son was in eighth grade and we moved here from Texas. Um, 
I have noticed, and I've kind of taken um, time to canvas some other parents informally, that it seems our kids are missing um, being taught study skills. And where that comes into play is um, as far as note taking, understanding maybe what kind of learners they are. And I think that was highlighted when we were completely virtual, which in some respects was a nice experience where some kids learned um, about themselves and how they do learn best. But those study skills are missing. And I've, I've heard that from younger grades up and through high school. I've uh, witnessed that myself uh, with my own two children and with high schoolers who I work with, I hear that often not knowing how to take good notes, um, not knowing if they're better served for themselves if they take notes on their computer or handwritten. And so I would just ask that um, collectively within the district, um, the board, and obviously the schools possibly look at how that can be addressed. And it may be addressed, um, but not uniformly across the school system. And when we are talking about equity, um, I would like all kids to have that opportunity to learn those skills. In my small time um, canvassing families, it sounds like some kids might get that and some kids might not. And the last point is talking to some college professors. They are noticing the same thing, not obviously just from our kids, but just in general that those study skills and teaching kids how to do that, how to have some organization, how to plan and track what they are responsible for, um, that that is missing. And not that it's just on the school shoulders. Uh, we as parents um, should accept some responsibility as well. So I thank you for your time. and. Once again, congratulations to all the new board members. Thank you. Next up is Ms. Susan Camp. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Susan Camp. It's nice to see you all in person. Um, I have two elementary age children, and one at Claremont and one at Tally Street. And I first wish to start off by congratulating our newly elected board members, Dr. Fulton, Mr. Utz, and um, Ms. Johnson Davis. Seeing this new board um, before me gives me a lot of hope in our district's ability to fully realize its potential in serving all of the families in this wonderful community. And I think it's especially noble to call to answer the call to serve during a global pandemic that has really disrupted our our lives and our children's education. Um, and I just wanted to um, add that I'm very grateful for the mitigation that um, our district has committed to in following the science and keeping our kids in person and safe. Um, of course, I have some qualms about some of those details, specifically outdoor lunch, but. Um, I have never been more grateful than I have been in the last two years to live in this district where health and safety and well-being of our children and our teachers so seriously. Um, but I am here tonight to talk about the inequities that I feel like our district has created um, in its policies regarding COVID and access to education. Currently, the policy states that students can only receive um, Instead of saying virtual, I'm going to go with online instruction if they test positive for COVID. The quarantine policy is problematic in that different documents contradict one another. If I understand CSE's policy correctly, families with a COVID positive member in their household must quarantine, yet they cannot receive any online instruction. Um, my family was negatively impacted by this policy this week, despite my family's best efforts to avoid contact. COVID for two years, my husband fell ill last week. And even if my children tested positive, they wouldn't have been able to access online um, learning because none of the K through five students have been distributed Chromebooks and I don't have enough computers in my household to accommodate a full day of online learning. Um, CSE's policies de-incentivize, I would almost say, punish parents for being forthcoming with their students' exposure to COVID because doing the right thing by quarantining at home means that your child will lose out on up to a week of school and instruction. At this time of year, um, I feel like this is especially 
problematic at this time of year for our middle and high school students who are managing coursework and preparing for IB and AP exams. This is when it really matters. And I can only imagine how much undue burden this places on those students in trying to stay on top of their work. Um, we have invested hundreds of thousands of dollars on remediating learning loss only to craft and implement a policy that exacerbates the very problems that we've been trying to address. So I really um, implore this board to review our COVID quarantine attendance and revise them so that they achieve the equitable access to learning and instruction that every family has the legal right to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our final person is Gisbell. Princess Spears. Princess? Yes, hello, good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much for opening up this forum for public comment. Um, I just wanted to say how much I appreciate City of Decatur Schools. We've just moved here uh, during the pandemic from Mississippi. Um, and as odd as school has been, uh, my children have had all four of them have had uh, amazing interactions with the teachers and the administrators. And they are truly engaged and we're grateful to be in City School of Decatur. The online experience that you all provided last year and was uh, heads and shoulders. <laughs> above the best school in Mississippi. <laughs> um, I feel like that, that tool uh, could be uh, used uh, at this moment when COVID cases are, are so high in our community. Uh, all of my kids, my family, were all triple vaxxed. <laughs> Um, we uh, test as frequently as we can. Um, tests are hard to come by these days. I know that you all are providing some between 6.30 and 8.30 in the morning, and I appreciate that. It causes me great pause uh, to be put in a position where I have to send my kids uh, to school in person because at home, my spouse and I have pre-existing conditions. So it, it really, I, I'm, I'm turning down production work. Um, my spouse isn't traveling and his corporation has allowed at home work and uh, They've made great accommodations as well. I feel like not having this option to have my kids not exposed to bring it home um, puts me as a parent in an awkward position uh, to make a choice between sending them to school and risking them bringing it home or having them uh, miss out on school and have unexcused absences. <laughs> My kids are doing great in school. Uh, we love in-person, we need in-person, but maybe this just isn't the right time for that to be the only choice. Again, I, I thank you for uh, accepting my comment. Um, and I appreciate the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. That was our last comment. Thank you. We will move on to superintendent's comments. Yes.
What's going on there? For that, hold on. Always have your <laughs> I don't know why. Okay. All right, greeting board members. I would like to first um, just welcome our new board members and welcome Dana back. Um, over the break, part of what I love about having a nice break over, over the holidays is get back into my reading routine. Um, and over this break, I was um, finally able to pick back up on my reading routine. Um, and I had been reading um, Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And I've spent the, the break rereading the first couple chapters um, and as I was rereading and I was thinking about a new board, new board members coming on and a new team um, ahead of us, a quote from one of the first chapters really stuck out about the power of policy in the first couple chapters. And he says, everyone has the power to discriminate, but only few have the power to make policy. And here he's talking about anti-racist policies and a governing body's authority to make those anti-racist policies. And I wanna thank our new board members and returning board members um, to be a part of that work because that is the job of the school board is to make school policy. Um, and I am encouraged by the new members on our team and looking forward to collaborating with all of them on this work as we move forward in making anti-racist policies in city schools of Decatur, because that is what's best for our students. And that's how we can root out discrimination and racism in our schools and our classrooms. Um, so just wanted to welcome everyone and just um, say that I'm looking forward to this new team's work together. Um, some general updates. I, um, like I said, have been reading. Um, I also have had continuing mentor meetups um, with Mary Elizabeth. Also have been developing a really positive relationship. I, I forgot to put this on there with uh, Cher, uh, Cheryl Watson Harris, the superintendent in DeKalb County. Um, her and I have been texting back and forth and talking. Um, she has been a great resource as we've been putting our minds together on um, trying to make sure we're collaborating as two school systems that are very close to each other. Um, also several calls with the metro area superintendents talking about plans, what different school districts were doing so that we were just had a nice open communication for plans across the, across the metro area. Um, stakeholder meetings, I wanna thank our COVID advisory teams. Uh, they put in so much work over the holidays, reviewing our mitigation strategies, providing feedback, um, sending emails, giving me input, uh, not just from the expert science perspective, but from the parents. And that's why I formed those two committees is so that I can have one group really focused on what does the science say? What does it look like? What are strategies we need to put in place? But then also a group that brings the parent voice um, and that has been really helpful for me as I've made um, decisions on what is best um, for our <laughs> system moving forward. Um, also had a great uh, checkup with our principals last Friday morning. It was great to see them. We did it virtually, um, but it was so nice to hear them. Um, they hear how they got to relax over the break and get their questions answered. That has been a really valuable uh, meeting for me every month as well. Um, just updates on working with my staff. I also want to thank the Wilson Center staff. They worked also tirelessly over the break. Um, I'm texting them. I'm asking them to proofread things, get some feedback on it, get ready to send out communications when we normally aren't um, sending out communications, and that has been really helpful. So great principals, great staff, and just amazing people in our community supporting our work. Um, and then today I held final round interviews for our Westchester principal position, um, three amazing candidates that we brought up to the final round. Today they met with me and presented their 90 day entry plan. So I'm looking through those again, calling references and we should have a final, I will have a final decision by Friday. So I'm really excited to, to make that final choice. Um, this is the first time I'll have made a final choice in a superintendency. I told the previous superintendent, hey, here's the two that I like. 
really feel the weight of that decision. So um, it's something I'm really thinking through to doing a um, very thorough reference check and just making sure we get that right person for Westchester. Um, okay, we have some really amazing things um, to share with um, the community and the board this evening. So first of all, I wanted to share our, um, every year we get a report from the state about our LEA determinations. Um, and what this does is this shares um, how our district has performed meeting requirements in the Individuals with Education Act. Um, in Georgia, they review this data at the Department of Ed and they make determinations whether we meet requirements, whether we need assistance or need interventions. And I am proud to say that of all the indicators, except for the one that has been the responsibility of the leader for the super for the district because last year it didn't get done on time we are 100 percent in compliance with all criteria and that is a huge accomplishment for Frances and her team um, to do that work and get that work done um, correctly the other big news i want to share is that for the first time since 2016-17 school year csd is no longer significantly disproportionate when it comes to student discipline determination for students of color with um, special needs. So that is also another huge accomplishment for our district. This has been a long process and work uh, going forward as a school system. This is the cultural change that we have been waiting for. There's call to action, there's work to be done. It takes time to put the right things in place and to make change. We can't just turn the Titanic overnight. It takes time, it takes dedication, it takes consistency. And we have seen that when we have the right people in place doing the right work, we are paying dividends towards our students that need that the most. So I wanna thank again, all of our schools. This has been through our implementation of PPIS, our uh, rewriting of the code of conduct, our implementation of restorative practices that has been leading us in this work and now we're seeing the results for that. So I wanna thank everyone there as well. Um, also, kudos to Sergio Perez. He's our Chief Operations Officer. He received his Sustainable Facility Certification, and this is really going to help CSD move forward in its eventual goal to be a carbon neutral district. So I want to thank Sergio for that. Um, also, two members of Eston's team, Kit Lee and Jason Wade um, from the Information Services Department, they have renewed and updated their industry certification as Google Workspace Administrators. Um, their certification attests their knowledge and skills to configure and implement our Google Workspaces environment in accordance with the educational best practices. Um, so they oversee over 7,000 staff and student laptops every day and do such a great job with that. So that's a lot of work. They're amazing, really supportive of these students. Um, some other things from our technology updates and upgrades. Um, our active panels, they arrived right before the December break. We received about 200 of them and they have replaced older active boards in our classrooms. Um, and as I've been in the classrooms, I've been seeing the new active boards and they look really nice and are much more user friendly than the previous ones. Um, so great job, Eston and his team with that. Um, so 99% of our new panels are on mobile carts. So you can move them around and really create those interactive classroom spaces um, like you, you would want to do. Also, this fall, Renfro and Decatur High School fully launched their student device program, transitioning to a take-home model that ensures students have the access to personal learning devices, not only in their classroom, but at home. Uh, we knew when we added this, it was difficult, um, but it really helped as Renfro had to transition to full virtual learning last week um, and made that transition, oh, I'm sorry, this week. Well, we made the decision last week, but we, students did virtual this week, um, much more smoother for those students. So both the active panel and the one-on-one -on -one project have been funded by SPLOST, and we are grateful for our community to continue to renew that East Bloss, um, um penny sales tax for us so we can do these amazing things for our students. Um, and finally, eight of our nine K-12 uh, received their external Wi-Fi infrastructures, um, and this has been a grant from the Georgia DOE, and this allows um, Wi-Fi to be accessed from a wide um, swath of you know, just outside the building. So students, if they need to pull up to outside the building or go and sit around outside the building, they can still access the school Wi-Fi. Um, and we have a final install happening at Winona Park in the near future. Okay, so there have been a lot of questions coming to the board and to me about our um, in-person learning and concurrent learning and virtual learning. Um, and I put together um, some information to share with our parents about this and help clear up any miscommunications um, or 
um, in, inaccurate information that may be floating around out there. So operating schools in the midst of COVID, it continues to be such a dynamic situation and we have to continually look at the data and understand what we're seeing and make plans um, for what's best for our students. We also know that there are various perspectives on how schools should provide instruction throughout this pandemic. The board and I both realize that one solution doesn't work for all families. It's not a one size fits all, so we have alternatives for students. CSD is prioritizing in-person learning during the COVID pandemic, and we have made this decision not only based on guidance from the CDC, the American Pediatric Association, President Biden, U.S. Secretary of Education, Dr. Cardona, but also supported by our COVID advisory team. Although CSD is prioritizing in-person learning, we do provide virtual options under two, under two areas. Number one, if students are mandated to quarantine or isolate as prescribed by the CDC guidance, those students can engage in concurrent learning. I've spoken with all my principals. They have assured me that when students are home for isolation or quarantine, they are being provided um, opportunities for concurrent learning. And this is where the teacher broadcasts that lesson so the student can engage at home. We're also offering virtual learning for students that may have a parents who may have a personal preference not to send their students or there's a medical necessity. Parents that elect for this type of virtual learning must apply or must be um, must submit their name and have their students attend our Decatur Virtual Academy. We listen to parent feedback from the first semester. We've made significant improvements in that program to support these students throughout this timing. We also are flexible on when they can come in and out of that program based on what the parents may need. Um, we have talked with our teachers about concurrent learning on a long-term basis. The overarching feedback from the teachers is that it is not sustainable for them to provide high quality concurrent learning on a daily basis going on long term. It creates additional planning. Um, it is just a lot, it's very taxing on the teachers to the point that it really waters down the excellent education that we can provide our students, both online and in person. They can muster it up and get it done for a few days here and there while students are at home quarantining or in isolation, but to do that in ongoing, it's just, it's just not sustainable for our teachers um, to complete lessons at the high quality that we expect them to do. Um, two other updates for COVID that I did wanna share. Um, you may have heard in the news that Governor Kemp issued a letter regarding flexibility of contact tracing. CSV will not be stopping contact tracing just because the governor said we could. We know it is best practice to contact trace and we will continue to do that as a school system. Um, also the crisis staffing plan, um, we did have to implement level four and um, switch to virtual learning for our middle school. Um, that was a difficult decision, but it was made because of significant number of teacher absences. Um, we were able to get it covered and make sure that we were open last week, um, but then did have to close. And the great thing was it allowed us time to look uh, Mr. Wiseman sent out a survey to his teachers and we were watching that data come in as teachers were reporting, am I ready to come back or are they still going to be in isolation? Um, and it was a very quick, easy decision to make when we looked at Wednesday, only like three teachers being out. So it has, um, it has worked. Uh, we will continue to use that. It is flexible on purpose so that we can monitor what we see. Um, and let me just give you an example of, let's say, um, Winona Park. So if Winona Park has um, nine of their teachers out, and all nine of those teachers are first grade teachers, that's almost impossible to cover all of those first grade classrooms. But if nine of their teachers are out and two are first grade, two are kindergarten, two are second grade, that makes it a little easier because we can plug in coverage like that. So that is one of the areas where we made it flexible, but it's also dependent on what the school organization is and how they schedule their students. Um, and we hope that we're, that guidance also provides parents um, a heads up on where we are. So if we get into the yellow phase, um, starting to look at, we're going to have increasing absences, we'll be communicating with the parents. Um, but this week we have been in green for every school, which means that we are able to cover all of those classes and continue as normal um, schedule and academics for all of our students. Our, that concludes my comments for this evening. Thank you, board. Thank you. Any questions for Dr. Furman? I had a couple questions. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you, Dr. Furman, for those for those comments. I did want to ask two questions: one about concurrent learning, and one about the uh, the long term DBA mm -hmm. program. Yep. So um, first, regarding concurrent mm -hmm. learning, I think you know we've heard from parents in this forum and elsewhere about concerns about it 
um, not being consistent. So I appreciate you sharing that, that we are communicating to the teachers and we're expecting, as I understand it, every time any student is absent due to quarantine or isolation due to COVID, their teacher in that circumstance will provide that student a concurrent learning option. And um, so then to, I think, um, some of the questions that have come before us today regarding access, if a child doesn't have a computer or doesn't have a mm -hmm. Chromebook or doesn't have an ability to access it, we, we probably want to have some sort of solution for them to be able to, sure. to act, particularly, I think, uh, the K-5 to question that yeah. came up. And the solution is that uh, parents to communicate with their classroom teacher that that's a need, and then the principal will have, we have plenty of laptop carts sitting in our schools. They are very happy to deliver those even house to house with our parents. I've seen our teachers, our principals do that. So we just need to know. Okay. If we don't know, we can't help, but they need to let us know. Great. Thank you. And then the second part around the concurrent learning is just a, if you could describe for us the clear escalation process, if a parent is not getting what they need through the concurrent learning, or if they are not able to get access to it, mm -hmm. who do they call? How do they yeah. go through that process? Yeah, so uh, first, the first resource for parents is always their classroom teacher. To let the teacher know, hey, I, you know, even if I have a Chromebook, it died, I need another one, let the classroom teacher, if they haven't heard back from the classroom teacher in a reasonable amount of time, I would say even just a couple hours when they're expecting concurrent learning. Um, and then the school principal will address that situation. Like I said, I've seen our school principals go and driving Chromebooks to houses um, for parents that needed them. Thank you, this one more question. Yeah. I did have a question. I think COVID has made us all distrustful, distrustful of data and where we get it. Um, and can you just kind of publicly talk about what the process is for communicating to parents when there is a case in schools? What is your policy? What is your expectation for principals mm -hmm. and what they can look at? So something you and I have spoken to and I've heard parents is we're getting sure. the thank you for the dashboard. <laughs> thank you for all the staff that contribute to yeah. the dashboard. And I think that as parents, there's a little bit of a like, well, there are three cases. I only got two emails. Mm -hmm. what, was going, what, are, what are they hiding? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the procedure is that anytime there is a positive case in the school, the principal would send out notification uh, to the whole school saying, hey, we've had a positive case in a classroom. If you're close contact, you will be getting inf direct information about being in close contact. Uh -huh. That's the protocol. Um, if the couple slipped through the cracks the first week, um, I mean, we apologize for that. It was the first week back. It was very busy. Our principals were covering classes. Right. So I, I did, do anticipate that the first week we were not on our A game because of all the, the busy work that we had going on. But that is the normal protocol. Okay. So moving, is it going to be, is there anything that allows a principal, let's say there are three cases that happen mm -hmm. in the day, God forbid, could a, could, um, uh, Principal Sanders say, send an email and say, hey, there were three cases today. Wanted you all to be aware, aware of that mm -hmm. as, as long as she is very clearly highlighting that or does she need yeah. to sit, send, <laughs> no. send, send? Yeah, no, and I haven't. Tomorrow morning is our meeting with principals and we're going to okay. share that updated procedure that if there are three cases and it's the end of the day and they've heard of three cases, they can then say, hey, we had one staff and three students in okay. our school positive today. Okay. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, Dr. Herman, I just have a couple of questions to piggyback off of this. So there's a variety of ways that kids and parents can be tested. So they can do a home test, they yeah. go to their pediatrician, and get a PCR, they go to viral solution. So how do we make sure that that data is correct in the dashboard and easily accessible? So are we so we're solely relying on parent reports? And if if so, that that's fine. You just need to be transparent that that's yeah. how the data is getting there. The other thing is. What plans do we have to um, improve or expand our current testing policy? Mm -hmm. um, because the the trick to making a lot of these mitigation um, measures work is whereby we are isolating the kids that need to be isolated, but not over isolating mm -hmm. children. So if we have testing in place, then um, you can you can test kids and get them back into the classroom quicker or mm -hmm. not isolate them at all yeah. if they don't need to be. So if there are any plans that um, to expand readily accessible testing for, for our students and even parents, I think that would be a great community endeavor. Yeah, so first question, um, yes, yeah, pretty much parent or staff report. Um, so if someone tests positive, 
we all, and I'll clarify this, we only report positive cases if students were in the building for a positive case. So our numbers on our dashboard were very low last week because lots of people got tested before they set foot in a building. And if they tested positive that Monday or over the weekend and said, hey, I tested positive, but never were in our school building, they would not have shown up on our dashboard. If a student was quarantined because they were exposed or in close contact over break, but never stepped foot in our building, we would not report them on our dashboard. Our dashboard is solely for in-school positive cases and in-school quarantine. Mm -hmm. And then we do solely rely on a parent to say, you know, little James tested positive over the weekend. Here's his test results. Um, he's going to be, and the nurse talk them, nurses talk them through when they can come back to school. So that's the reporting process um, for COVID with testing. Um, some parents were coming here to get tests in the morning. Do they get their test result? They send it to the school. Um, our nurses, and let's talk in your next question about enhancing our testing protocol. We are enhancing that. Uh, we did, um, nurses got trained um, uh, through the new system that they, not a new system, but just a little bit of a different system on how to add the testing information. The testing company that we're working with is going to be providing our school nurses with point of care tests. So if a student is symptomatic or we want to do tests to stay at the local school, they can test them at the local school. The nurse can do the test at that local school. So we are enhancing that level of testing. We're also expanding our hours of testing um, where we have our central office testing in the morning. We're also going to be adding hours in the afternoon. Um, and then we also are working with MAKO on um, going back to re-implementing our weekly screening tests um, in the upcoming future. They gave us a date. Until we know that that 100% is the date, we're not going to um, put it out there. We were hoping to get started um, with not this week, but next week. Um, once we have a um, that they can go ahead and re-sign up for the consent, um, and we will start that process back up. Um, and then we have our testing um, for the next week. Dr. can you please clarify um, the K-5 Chromebook distribution that was mentioned earlier? Is that, um, are those, for those grade levels, are those just issued on an as-needed basis? Okay. Yes. Okay. So, and what I'll share with principals is if you're sending a student home from school because they tested positive, go ahead and give them a Chromebook to take okay. home with them. But if they need a Chromebook, we just need to know and we will get them a Chromebook. We okay. have plenty of technology. There's no reason that a student should not have a Chromebook if they need one. Okay. Any other questions? All right, we will move on to Chair's comments. I want to begin the chair's comments with a thank you to Ms. Tasha White for her leadership as board chair over the past year. Um, last year was a trying time for CSD, and Ms. White was at the helm um, leading our district and helping us to successfully navigate those challenges. Um, thank you for your service, and I look forward to your continued guidance as we work to ensure the continued success of CSD students. Um, thank you to my fellow board members for their votes of confidence as the new board chair. Um, I also want to thank the Honorable Rathelia Stroud for taking time out of her busy schedule to swear in the new board members. Um, I'm a third generation teacher and to be sworn in as a school board member and board chair uh, is to witness the answered prayers of my ancestors. And so I'm excited about this opportunity and I'm excited about continuing the work. I want to officially welcome Dr. Dr. Carmen Sultan <laughs> and Mr. Hans Hood, um, to the board. Um, they both bring skill sets and experiences that promise to make this board even stronger. Congratulations to board member James Herndon on um, your election as the board vice chair. Um, it is my pleasure to have the opportunity to continue to work with you, but even closer now. I want to welcome back our students, teachers, and staff from the holiday break. Dr. Furman and her team have been working hard to keep CSD students safely in person. And there are several thank yous that we need to um, make um, this evening uh, for that, those efforts. I wanna start with a special thank you to CSD staff for always going above and beyond. Thank you to Dr. Huddleston for all she is doing to get testing back up and running at the school. Thank you to Shonda Moore for her work in bringing the vaccine and health clinics to our district. And thank you to our community partners, DeKalb County Board of Health, DeKalb Pediatric Center, and Oakhurst Pediatrics, who supply vaccines to our community. I also want to thank the nurses who jumped in to give COVID tests last week, and to all of our nurses um, who are helping our families to navigate COVID and, perform, and for performing contact tracing. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you to the Wilson Center employees and school staff for jumping in and covering classes. Um, and last but not least, thank you to our parents for always doing whatever you can to support our, um, our schools, including signing up to be substitute teachers. And so we really appreciate that. Um, I also want to wish Godspeed to Shana Bruton um, as she leaves CSD to pursue other endeavors. Um, the board appreciates all the support that you have given us. Finally, we know that the pandemic continues to present challenges, um, but we also know that we are better informed and prepared than we were this time last year. At this moment, however, there are members of our community who are physically healing from COVID, and there are those who are still healing emotionally from the toll of the past two years. However, I find comfort in a quote by the late author, activist, and educator, Bell Hooks, that says, rarely, if ever, are any of us healed in isolation. Healing is an act of communion. So I'm asking the entire CSD community to continue to lean in. I encourage our students to, our students to check on the student that sits next to you in class and the student who lives next door. Teachers and staff, please check in with your team members. And parents, please keep being the glue that holds us together. Let's continue to be in communion with each other as we heal together and thrive as a district. That's all I have for the chair's comments. Board members, did you all have anything that you wanted to add or share? I'll wait for a minute. Mm -hmm. When I think about where CSD was as a system a year ago and some of the uh, incredible challenges that the system faced, and I'm not just talking about COVID, um, we're just in a substantially better position now than we were at that time. And Ms. White, I want to thank you for your leadership taking this board to where we are today. Much of the work that was done is uh, and has been done by you uh, leading the board. And so thank you for your service. And uh, I'm honored to be on this board with you. And then to uh, Ms. Johnson Davis, uh, I have witnessed in your tenure in board uh, your willingness to speak truth to power. Uh, I think that speaks your courage. I think that speaks to your system. I think that speaks to your moral well, conviction. And um, I mean, it helps also that I think that you were right. <laughs> and uh, I just want to tell you that I'm honored to be on this board with you as well. I'm looking forward to uh, serving under your leadership. Thank you. And. Uh, Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. If there are no other comments, then we will move on to the consent items. Um, may I have a motion to approve the consent items one through five? Motion to approve uh, consent items one through five. Second. Thank you. Okay, so we will move on to our items for action, information, or discussion. And uh, this is where we will sign the uh, code of, well, we will vote in favor of approving the code of ethics. All those in favor, let it be known. Uh, all those in favor um, of accepting the code of ethics, let it be known by a vote of aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So I need clarification from our council. When do we sign that? Aye. Yes. Okay. Cause yeah, if they've got their printed copy, they can sign that one. Okay. Um, if not, we'll get one for them in exact session. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we will move on um, to item number two, um, the superintendent search. The board feels that we owe the community a search for superintendents, and we um, hope that Dr. Furman will submit her name for consideration. The school board association um, 
the Georgia School Board Association has agreed to come to the board's next work session on January 25th to give um, a presentation on how they conduct superintendent searches. Are there any questions or? All right, and we will now move on to um, item number three. Um, I'm sorry. Sorry, <laughs> being a little slow. I, I, I would did want to re reiterate that we we all are all in agreement that we hope that Dr. Furman does throw her name into the hat and consider her thing um, for consideration. I think that um, just given the timing, board search is, is may, and that that is not necessarily a reflection on the job that Dr. Furman has done. It is a reflection of what we feel as board members we are obligated to say. You said it succinctly as a chair member, um, and I wanted to reiterate that second part. Just for emphasis. Thank you. We will move on to the um, updated charge policy for school meals. Um, and so the U.S. Department of Ed um, did change some of their policy regarding bad debt for school nutrition departments, um, which prompted us to make a change in our charge policy. Um, it really does not impact our schools this school year because all students are receiving free lunch, uh, but it does impact what our schools can carry in a what is called bad debt. Uh, moving forward in next school year. So there is an updated charge policy uh, for the board to review. Um, we've gotten some feedback on that. Um, and what I've, um, what we'll be putting in place is kind of a, a slush fund stop gap. So I'll be working with PTAs um, to create a fund at each school. So if there are students that have accumulated um, meal charges or don't have funds to pay for the meals, we will be making sure that they are not being denied food at any time. Um, and that we are having stop gaps in place to make sure those students can get lunch um, when they, in, in breakfast when they need it. Any questions about the policy? I, I did just want to ask a <laughs> clarifying question that the language change is being driven by a federal requirement that we meet mm -hmm. and that we are not, I just to reemphasize, we are actually not going to be preventing any children from getting lunch okay. based on this policy. Yes, correct. It's just what we're being required to do to meet a federal regulation. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And so now we will move on to the action item. I'm sorry, um, items for action number four, budget primer presentation and calendar. Welcome up uh, the amazing Miss Lanita Broom. I'm wearing my favorite Steeler colors today. Thank you, Miss Broom. Um, so we'll let her go ahead and take it away. She's going to walk us through the next phase of our budget um, planning um, information. Good evening, Madam Chair. Good evening. Vice Chair, members of the board, Superintendent Furman, community, and colleagues. This evening, I present to you the district's budget primer. The information presented today is for informational purposes only, as needed for discussion on the current fiscal year 22 and upcoming fiscal year 23 budget. Mm -hmm. There are a variety of areas that we will review including a brief overview of the city, the district, the budget calendar, and a budget overview of the district funds and the budget process. Some of the information has been pre presented to you previously. This slide is an overview of some of the major factors in the city that the top 10 employers in the city are listed. The top five employers in the city are the DeKalb County government, Emory University, Cater Board of Education, Agnes Scott College, and the City of Decatur. The top 10 taxpayers are listed. The top five taxpayers are MARTA, AMCO, Decatur Properties, Mac Reed, and Tyco. City of Decatur unemployment rate is 1.7%, which is less than the state's unemployment rate of 2.2%, and DeKalb County's unemployment rate of 2.5%. This is a map of the city schools of Decatur locations throughout the city. Fiscal year 22 data facts, we have 12 learning facilities, including the early learning centers and virtual academy. We have a little under 6,000 students with approximately 5,614 in K-12. 
The K-12, the gender rate is almost one half male and one half female. We have a free and reduced eligibility rate of 8.75%, which is the lowest free and reduced meal percentage in the state. The financial efficiency rating measures an individual school district per pupil spending in relation to the academic achievement of its students. A three-year average of per pupil expenditures in schools from college and career ready performance index are used to determine a district's rating. The high school of five is reached from having a low per pupil expenditure in a high college and career ready performance index. The district score of 2.5 indicates that the district has a high per pupil expenditure and a high college and career ready performance index. The fiscal year 22 general fund budget is approximately 83.9 million. The district spends $14,876 per pupil, and the millage rate is 21. The district 2019 college and career ready performance index of 87.9 is 9.10 points higher than the state's average of 78.8. City Schools of Decatur is the 62nd largest district in the state and is considered a medium-sized district. This year 23 budget calendar started on November at the work session discussion on the budget timeline and priority. At January's work session, we will review the initial allotment and enrollment forecasting. And in February, we will review the preliminary this year 23 budget draft presentation. The district uses fund accounting to track the amount of revenue assigned to different purposes. Assigning revenue by fund provides more transparency and accountability. General, capital, school nutrition, and special revenue are the board operates under. The Board of Education approves and adopts the annual budget at the aggregate level of funds. General fund. General fund is the district's primary operating account. The fund has less restrictions than any other fund and is the largest source of revenue and expenditures for the district. General fund revenue is made up of three categories. Local sources, which is primarily property tax and other local sources, consists of miscellaneous revenue, such as transportation fees, interest, facility rentals, and local grant reimbursement. Federal sources of revenue include reimbursable grants, such as vocational grants and pre-K lottery. State source is revenue from the state that is tied directly to student enrollment. This is a snapshot of the local revenue from 2019 to 2022. Fiscal year 19 through 21 is actual, and fiscal year 22 is the current year budget. The millage rate highlighted in yellow increased from 20.25 to 21 for the fiscal year, which brought an additional 1.6 million in revenue collection. The digest has steadily increased for the last three years. Other local revenue consists of investment earnings, which fluctuates with the economy. For fiscal year 21 and 22, earnings have drastically decreased. Tuition charges are charges for all tuition paying students in the district, including the Early Childhood Learning Center. The 33% decrease in tuition for fiscal year 21 was due to the closure of the center during the pandemic. Tuition revenue is projected to increase by 87% from last year to current year due to the reopening of all cases. The 200 33 increase in other local revenue in fiscal year 20 was due to a capital outlay grant from the state. State revenue is revenue from the Georgia Department of Education and is based on factors related to student enrollment, learning ability, and scheduling. This slide shows state revenue history from 2019 to present. Highlighted in yellow is revenue earned prior to any deduction. We received revenue for earned salaries, operational costs, and category grants such as transportation and nursing. 
since 2020, the state has deducted revenue from our Syrity Cup. This year, we will see a reduction of approximately $1.3 million in our Syrity Cup. In addition to our Syrity Cup, QBE earned revenue is also reduced by the local five mil share. To participate in the QBE program, the state requires the deduction equivalent to five meals, which equates to five dollars of property taxes for every one thousand of assessed valuation. For, for the current fiscal year 22, our portion of the five mil is approximately 8.7 million. As shown, there is a significant difference between what we earn, highlighted in yellow, and what we actually receive, highlighted in green. This slide is a visual of the revenue in the district received from the three sources, federal, local, and state. The chart on the left is the distribution percentage of state average for all school districts in Georgia. The chart on the right is city schools of Decatur distribution of revenue for the general fund. The district receives our largest portion of revenue, 58%, from local sources, whereas most districts receive their largest portion 47% from the state. The total fiscal year 22 general fund revenue budget is approximately 79.7 million, with 45.5 million from local sources, 30.7 million from state sources, and 3.5 million from other local sources. This slide shows the history of local and state revenue from 2017 to present. Local revenue is shown in gray and state revenue is shown in yellow. Consistently outpaces state revenue as shown on the previous slide. State revenue can be reduced at any time by the governor in the form of austerity cuts. This slide shows the history of revenue per student for local and state funds from 2017 to present. The last line is the total revenue <coughs> per student. From 2017 to present, total revenue per student has increased by 2,400. This is a snapshot of enrollment growth from 2013 to present. The enrollment numbers are based on the QBE state report. The district enrollment increased from 2013 to 2020, and in 2021 to present, enrollment has decreased. This slide shows tax revenue in comparison with enrollment. Enrollment is in blue, and tax revenue shown in millions of dollars is in green. In blue, you see the enrollment line decrease, decreases in fiscal year 21. Tax revenue in green decreased from fiscal year 17 to fiscal year 18 and has increased from 2018 to present. Below the graph is the millage rate for each year and the additional revenue received as the tax digest grew. From 2017 to 2018, the tax digest decreased by 1.4%. The net digest per student is listed with a percent change from 2018 to present, the net digest per student has increased as the revenue increase. Major revenue influencers that impact the general fund include enrollment growth. As enrollment increases, so does the enrollment from so does the revenue from the state. Changes in local sources include increases or decreases in millage rate, growth of the tax digest, and increases and decreases in tuition. Additionally, scheduling impact funds along with deductions from local fair share, austerity cuts, changes in teachers' pay skills, and changes in teacher retirement. General fund expenditures fall into several major categories. General funds can be grouped by function or object code. The category list, as you're looking at, is expenditures by object code. Object codes break expenditures down into the specific purpose for the expenditure. Function codes break expenditures down by category for the expenditures. This slide shows that salary and benefits are always the largest portion of expenditures and make up 84 to 86% of the general fund budget. 
For fiscal year 22, salary and benefits are budgeted at approximately 72.7, as highlighted in yellow under the subtotal salary and benefits. Other expenditures, also referred to as operating expenses, are all other expenses not associated with salaries and benefits. I want to point out the large percentage change in travel, lodging and registration of 4,315% from fiscal year 21 to fiscal year 22. This large percentage is for in fiscal year 22 is due to the pandemic in fiscal year 21. Because of the pandemic, our travel was suspended in fiscal year 21 and funds were reallocated from travel to other expenditure areas. Total expenditures for fiscal year 22 is approximately 83.9 million. As shown on the bottom row, total expenditures have increased from 66.2 million in fiscal year 19 to 83.9 million in fiscal year 22. Costs associated with the opening of Kelly Elementary and salary and benefit increases over the years are the major factors that contributed to the increase in total expenditures. This slide is a visual of the fiscal year 22 general fund categorized by function. The largest expenditure is instruction, which makes up 63% of the total budget. The second largest expenditure is maintenance and operation, which makes up 9% of the budget. And again, this is by function. This slide is a bar graph of the expenditures for fiscal year 22 budget. This is the year 21 and 20 actual, and the last column chart is the statewide average for school districts in Georgia. The district spends a little more in instruction than the average school district, but overall the district spending trends are in line with the state average. This is a pie chart by object of the historical expenditure trend of the district from 2019 to present. Salaries and benefits make up the largest portion at 86%. So basically, the district's largest spend is in instructions for salaries and benefits. This slide is a side by side comparison of fiscal year 19 through fiscal year 22 revenue and expenditures. Fiscal year 19 through 21 are actual expenditures, and fiscal year 22 are budgeted expenditures. As shown, each year, expenditures are increasing at a faster rate than revenue. Major expenditure influencers are all associated with salaries. Since salaries is over 85% of the budget, any increase or decrease associated with salaries have a substantial impact on expenses. This slide is a visual which represents the amount of revenue received per student versus the amount of expense. Revenue is represented by the gray and expenses are represented by the yellow line. As revenue decreases, expenditures continue to increase. This slide shows the revenue versus expenditures per student from 2019 to present. Highlighted in blue is the student enrollment for each of the fiscal years. Highlighted in yellow is the state QBE revenue earned per student. Be mindful that the QBE earned is the amount earned, not received. This is the amount before deduction of the local five meal and austerity cuts. The actual state QBE revenue received is listed as state revenue, and the state revenue received per student is highlighted in gray. There are various factors that impact the amount earned from the state, including scheduling and a student's learning ability. Local revenue per student, which consists primarily of property tax, is shown highlighted in pink. The total revenue received per student is highlighted in light green. The total expenditure spent per student is highlighted in dark green. When the total expenditures are deducted from the total revenue, the last row shows the fiscal impact per student. In fiscal year 19, we earned 202 more in revenue than we spent. Fiscal year 20, we earned $5 more than we spent. In fiscal year 21, we spent over $1,000 more in expenses than we received in revenue. In fiscal year 22, we are budgeted to spend 732 more than we spent. 
fund balance. The fund balance is the difference between revenue and expenses. We also refer to the fund balance as the district reserve. The district was able to give 2,000 increases to all teachers in fiscal year 21 by using the fund balance. Additionally, the district was able to sustain during the pandemic outbreak and continue to pay all employees by using the fund balance. Board policy specifies a fund balance between 4 and 15%. This slide shows 12 months of actual ending fund balance. Fund balance fluctuates throughout the year. Timing of when revenue is received impacts fund balance throughout the year. You will see a larger fund balance in July, August, and September when a large portion of tax revenue is booked. You will also see a large balance, a large fund balance in January, February, and March for tax collection in December. In June 2021, we ended the year with a fund balance of 10.1 million. This is a line graph of the ending fund balance from fiscal year 19 to the current budget. For the last two years, we see the impact on the fund balance as expenditures increase at a faster pace than revenue. This slide shows the fund balance as a percentage of expenditures. The minimum fund balance as required by board policy is the 4%, which is represented by the red line. The green line is the fund balance percentage from 2019 to 2022. We anticipate ending the current fiscal year at 7%. The next fund we will discuss is capital funds. Capital funds consist primarily of funds received from the Education Special Local Option Sales Tax, referred to as SLOT. In fiscal year 1998, the Georgia legislature passed a law allowing districts to establish a one cent sales tax that could be used for capital projects or debt retirement. The district is currently collecting taxes for SLOT 5. Tax taxpayers voted for SLOT 6, and collections for SLOT 6 will begin in July. Each SLOT is for five years, and the district used the funds for various capital projects such as construction and building improvements and technology enhancements. Box funds have restrictions and cannot be used for salary. This is the fiscal year 22 budget for SLOT 5. The district is anticipating on receiving 5 million in SLOT funds, and we have a fund balance of approximately 11.6, 11.7 million. Fiscal year 22 expenditures are estimated to be approximately 10.5 7 million, which leaves an estimated fund balance of approximately 5.9 million. School nutrition funds. School <coughs> nutrition funds are accounted for in a separate fund per federal requirement. The district is currently participating in a program by the federal government that allows for all students to eat at no cost. Meals must be prepared in accordance with the Food and Nutrition Services in the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The district supplements school nutrition by a little under $1 million from general funds. Those funds are primarily allocated for school nutrition salaries and benefits. We are projecting to serve approximately 504,000 student lunches and 93,000 student graduates. School nutrition revenue consists of other local revenue from catering and contracts, revenue from sales, State revenue is the salary supplement received from the state, and federal revenues represent near reimbursements from the federal government. School nutrition expenditures. The two largest expenses associated with school nutrition are salaries and food purchases. Special revenue funds. Special revenue consists primarily of grants received from the federal government. Funds are spent on a reimbursable basis, meaning reports must be submitted to indicate what purchases have been made in order to receive reimbursement. The funds are restricted in that they can only be used for the purpose the grant was awarded. The amount awarded for federal grants are based on the state's calculated poverty percentage, which is tied directly to the census data for the city. Other factors included in the calculation for the poverty percentage include residence eligibility, a supplemental nutrition assistance program, 
also referred to as SNAP, and the district student and reduced lunch. As stated earlier, the district has the lowest eligibility rate in the state amount for our grant are not as large as other districts. This is the projected budget for improved by federal grants. Grants are still being awarded for fiscal year 22. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So pre-K, we anticipate on receiving approximately $829,000. However, we project the actual cost to run the program will be approximately $1.2 million, which means we must supplement the program with $394,000 from general. This slide represents the expenditures from the federal CARES grant that will be reallocated to general funds in fiscal year 23. We received a small amount of CARES funds due to our poverty. Other districts are able to get bonuses with their CARES funds and have more money than they know what to do with. Unfortunately, the city of does not have that fund. <laughs> the budget process. The budget process begins with looking at the current fiscal year 22 budget and incorporating any known increases or decreases into the budget. For example, we made the assumption that austerity cuts will continue until the governor advises us otherwise. We project the end of fund balance for the current year, which will, begin, which will be the beginning fund balance for the fiscal year 23 budget. This is all part of budget forecasting and the planning phase. We look at enrollment and the local fair share and the impact the millage rate will have on revenue. We look at exemptions and the impact salary and benefits adjustments will have on the budget. Last year, we reallocated approximately three point. $4 million of general fund expenses to the CARES grant, as shown on the previous slide, we will need to reallocate those expenditures back to general fund until the year 23. Reviewing and analyzing revenue and expenditures assumption and observations is the first step in the budget process and provides us with our first initial preliminary draft of the budget. This process took place at November's work session. The next step in the planning phase is to review the state budget process. This slide is a summary of the state budget process. We watch the process closely because this is where we will learn what, if any, salary increases will be proposed, if austerity cuts will continue, and any modification to state funds. The governor typically gives the state of address in mid-January. The information obtained from the state budget process is instrumental in establishing the district's tentative budget. If there are amendments to the current budget, they will be discussed in the state budget process. However, we must remain mindful that there are and have always been situations where the governor made proposals for a budget and those proposals change. For example, in fiscal year 21, the state budget proposed $2,000 salary, $2, salary increases to all employees pay on the teacher salary scale. Unfortunately, after the onset of the pandemic, the 2000 was taken out of the proposal and instead district received austerity cuts. You will recall the board gave the 2000 increase to teachers, even though the governor did not. This is a visual of the district's budget process. We are currently in the planning phase of the process for fiscal year 23. We are working with departments and schools to prioritize budget requests and allotments and watches the state budget and process. We will move into the preparation phase in February. At this phase, revenue assumptions can be made based off of the governor's state of the state address. Expenditure assumptions will also be assessed at this phase. The preparation phase and the analysis and review phase run concurrently in many areas. We will also review community input received from the web page and incorporate for budget priorities. Dr. Furman and I are in the process of setting up budget meetings as needed with principals and department heads. After several budget presentations and hearings and millage rate hearings, the four budgets will be consolidated into a district-wide consolidation budget draft and presented to the board as a tentative budget. 
Community input will be solicited for comments on the tentative budget. The superintendent and I will ensure all stakeholders are part of the decision-making process. And a final consolidated budget by fund, function, and object will be presented to the board for adoption and approval. The board is scheduled to tentatively approve the fiscal year 2023 budget at April's board meeting and final approval at May's board meeting. After the board's final approval, the finance department will begin implementation of the budget on July 1st. The finance department, in conjunction with budget managers at the school and department level, will review and assess the budget on an ongoing basis to keep track of how well programs are being implemented and the rate at which funds are being extended. The finance department, superintendent, and board are committed to being good stewards of the taxpayers' funds by operating with high integrity in a manner that is transparent and honest. The appendix contains a list of state function codes and definitions. This concludes the budget primer presentation. This is the district's first budget primer, and the goal was to provide all stakeholders with knowledge to help understand the district's budget and the process for the budget de development. The presentation will be available on the district website. I know this was a lot of information shared with you in a short time frame. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lanita. Thank you, Lanita. Well done, as always. Um, any questions or discussions from the board? I got a couple. <laughs> um, early on, you did a comparison between Decatur and then the rest of Georgia, and this is not anything I want or I'm like, go back, but just in thinking, every time I look at that or every time a member of the community asks me, it's really Decatur versus the metro Atlanta area versus Georgia. And I think that's such a better point for making comparisons when we consider what we want to do. When we looked at teacher salaries in the last one, it's like, what are we paying to live in Atlanta? When we're looking at what we're paying for students, I don't know that it's that useful to say like, this is what the city, so just in the, as we're moving forward with some stuff, I don't know how hard it is to create that data point, but I would love to see it. Just the metro areas? Yeah, just like a norm for those pie charts where it's like, so this is what George is spending, this is what Atlanta is spending, this is what Decatur is spending. That would be useful. That just popped up as like a norm and a thought. Take, take with it. With, if it's a huge burden, it's a huge burden. But, um, second thing is, is, I've mentioned this before, in the during the process where we do sort of compliance, there were some recent changes to what can be included in East Block plans. They expanded some of the technology and the tech, and I would like for there to just sort of be a carved out part where the 2.8 million we're currently spending annually on technology and upgrades to technology. Um, what, if any part of that could be thrown from a compliance perspective under that East Blast umbrella, um, I think would be a huge you're asking, like, what are we spending in general fund that can be okay? Yeah, yeah, because we yeah. definitely got a distinct thing that, that mm -hmm. as part of the East Plus presentation, because you you can't use those funds. That's yeah. pretty, right. pretty clear. You yeah. can't use it to pay teachers more. You can't use it to buy books. Mm -hmm. But you can, I'm, my understanding is they expanded it to where you could use it on like technology. technology contracts now. Yeah. That's a big chunk. That was 2% of our current general fund is an amorphous kind of like, well, I had it as water, sewage, garbage, maintenance, technology, supplies, software, equipment, repairs, and maintenance generally. And so it's part of the process saying, where can we find that? Because we're, we're carrying $11 million in unspent East Plus 5 funds and 6 is about to go in. I think that's being a good steward of our budget. Yeah, and that's part of what our budgeting meetings will be with each okay. department is to okay. look through their budgets. They've done a nice line by line um, comparison for us. Okay. Um, so we'll be going through those with each budget manager. Okay. And then the last thing, and, and this is more for the for the superintendent, and and you spoke on it. It's an election year. The governor's already said he's going to give five thousand dollars <laughs> to every employee of the state multiple times. He's going to say it. And then the rug's going to get pulled out from under teachers again. I, I just want us to be on top of communicating when that happens, what's happening, what we as a board are on top of and committed to, um, and what we can do um, thoroughly, because there's nothing worse than <laughs> reading in the paper you're getting a $5,000 raise, and, yeah. and then you don't. 
because as you can see, the state does not necessarily always come through with what they're saying, mm -hmm. and that can make for a pretty crappy Christmas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, so I have a couple of questions, if I may. Um, first of all, on, on page 146, it's the uh, pie chart showing the um, general fund expenditures broken out by, you know, instruction and all the other various categories. Let us get this. We're all looking at the same thing. There we go. Can we um, get this uh, a historical picture of this? I think that's going to help us a lot on some decision making. I, I think um, I just want to be transparent with the community and everybody up here. The fund balance is not um, sustainable, as you have made clear to us. We're going to have to take action on that this year, and I think that there is going to be, as we've mentioned before in public meetings, everything has to be on the table. And so ensuring that if cuts are made, we're not slicing the instructional side and instead focusing on the overhead side, a historical perspective of this data specifically will help guide us as we have those policy conversations and level set for the, uh, for the community. Um, just a quick question on the fund balances. Were all of those balances that you showed unassigned or was there a mix of assigned and unassigned in those? Throughout the year, it's a mix of assigned and undersigned because that's the funds that we are using to operate. Okay, great. Right. That's helpful. Um, that, that that five mil share, just, you know, I realize there's nothing we're going to do about it, but I'm going to attempt to explain this live. Um, it really ends up acting as a double hit on us. So even if we did everything to hold our budget flat, rolling our millage back and ensuring we didn't spend an extra cent, we would still have more money taking out, like we would have to cut more in, to make up that particular difference. So um, I think it would be helpful for us to understand what a millage impact would be on a tax basis to keep that even. It's going to be small, but it'll still be like a half a percent or half a mil or something along those lines. And we should be kind of transparent around what that is. Okay. Uh, and then the last thing, and, and I think this is this may be directed a little bit more at, at Maggie, but I would like to look at, or Dr. Furman, I'm sorry, I would like to look at um, tuition and fees, particularly for areas where, uh, obviously not when we're talking about disadvantaged or underprivileged, but for people that are using our services, what are the market rates and are we assured that we're actually um, charging what is a fair price? to the folks that are using it to ensure that we're getting the revenue when that is appropriate. Yeah, and, and Sarah Garland's actually been meeting and working with her team on discussing rate increases. So. Great. Great. I have thousands more questions, but I won't take up all of our time. We're going to have plenty of time to talk. <laughs> <laughs> plenty of time to talk about. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Anita, um, you know, when I took on this position, I was um, promised the, the community that we would go through the budgeting process with transparency and clarity, and um, Lanita has stepped up to that and done an amazing job really providing additional information um, to make sure we meet that need. So thank you, Lanita. Thank you. All right. Item number five is the updated district wellness plan. Yep, and that is just for information, um, unless the board has any questions. That's just one of those reports that we put in uh, for the board to review from time to time. So can keep it fresh, and if you have any questions, let us know. Okay. Thank you. All right, so we are at future date. Um, we have the board retreat coming up for, um, on February 24th. Um, there are some spring um, workshops that are scheduled um, on here. Um, the in-person dates are listed, but looks, well, the virtual date is uh, to be um, disclosed. We have new member orientation on February 23rd, 22nd through the 23rd. Um, regional workshop on a specialty topic, that date uh, is yet to be determined. Um, the GSBA Summer Free Conference Workshops on June 9th, 
um, and then the summer conference and delegate um, at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Savannah, June 10th through the 11th. And I guess the only one I didn't see was the work session that's coming up on January 25th. Oh, yep. Okay. That one. Um, the one thing about the work session on the 25th of January is that's also the state of the city right. address. Um, so what we, if I'm remembering correct, um, I wasn't in this seat when we did it last year, but we kind of watch it together as a board and then we roll into our work session. Is that what's happened yeah, in the past? That's what will happen and okay. um, the, the, the chair will have uh, the comments, Madam Chair will have the comments at the beginning. Yeah. Um, and then um, and then the city will go in and then we can go ahead and, and leave if we need to start our meeting. And I do believe, um, I'll look and email you all, I do believe Mayor Garrett said that they were also potentially starting at a half hour earlier. Oh, okay. So that we can have a little more time to be able to so I will, um, I'll double check on that. Okay. Any other questions or comments about future dates? Um, and I just wanted to say, I'm sorry for the, the interruption. I probably should have said it earlier, but um, I wanted to first thank um, you guys for the nice words and encouraging words. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I've been on the board for six years and last year was um, by far the toughest, um, the heaviest uh, to get through. And so I do appreciate um, you recognizing the hard work that, that we all put in, um, but that I put in as a chair. Um, and I just also wanted to recognize that we, as you stated, are, at, are, are, are in the, going in the direction that we need to go. And we are far, far ahead than where we were this time last year. Um, and I contribute that to our district. I contribute that to our community. I uh, contribute that to the board. Um, and I also contribute that to um, choosing Dr. Herman as our superintendent. I think he's done a phenomenal job in getting us to the place that we are. So I just wanted to piggyback on, on what the board member said, that this is not um, a reflection of your work. Um, and I um, also wanted to just share with the community that we would love to hear from you as well, um, even though you guys are never shy about communicating with us. <laughs> but I'll just go ahead and extend that to you. Um, but yeah, we, we still would love to hear from the community on your thoughts um, on our superintendent um, search, just so that we have a pulse on how you feel and and what your thoughts are, what are you looking for in a superintendent. Um, would also uh, encourage staff to please reach out to us, email or phone calls. Um, we wanna make sure that your voice is heard as well on what you're looking for as somebody to, that's leading the helm. Um, so over the next month, this is gonna be pretty much, um, you know, pretty full force ahead for us. And so any, any um, conversations that you would like to have I'm open to meeting people virtually for now and then for coffee soon, hopefully. Um, so I, any of us um, are willing to do that or just meet with you over the phone or email engagement just so that we can ensure that we are hearing um, from all of you in the district and in our community. Thank, Thank you. you for the time. Yep. Any other comments? Hearing none, we will adjourn the meeting. And we will move into exec executive session. Yeah. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we did it. We got it. Good job, Jada. Good job, Jada. Good job, Jada. Good job, Jada.